Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the show. We're going to keep it super brief on the intro this week because we have a fantastic interview with Michelle Ferrari. Michelle is our representation up in Ottawa. She is our local MP, and she is doing a fantastic job. We sat down to talk about life as a politician, making that transition, what it's like an average day in the life in Ottawa, and then just a lot of good talk about housing, what we're all about here on this channel. So if this is your first time tuning in, I am putting out weekly videos, much uh, of, of market updates, very statistical based. And then every other week, we're diving into some long format interviews about this housing crisis, um, our local si housing situation here, and you know, talk about the way forward. So I hope everybody enjoys the show. If you're on YouTube and want to watch this long format interview, if you want to listen, we are on all three major podcast apps. That is Apple, uh, Spotify, and Google, and I believe a few others as well. But if you just want to listen, that's there. And if you're new on YouTube, uh, feel free to subscribe. I hope everybody really enjoys this interview and thank you so much to Michelle for taking the time to have this dialogue and your legitimate concern for the people of your riding. Enjoy the interview. Okay, so welcome Michelle Ferrari. Uh, last time any of the, the viewers of, of my stream here saw Michelle, she was just in the in the middle of, of going for the the basically conservative nomination to run for the, the MP position here. Um, and, and here we are. How long has it been? Well, I was elected September 20th. So we're almost in hit the seven, seven months almost. Wow. Almost yeah. And you have been in such a busy time. <laughs> they, <laughs> say it's the, they say it's the craziest politics have been in history. That's what they've said about this this parliament i can imagine what a, like, what a time i like to, to i like to jump in the deep end mitch That's yeah I, apparently i like to do things are like this has never been done before this has never happened before this has never happened before. <laughs> yeah every day for like, sure yeah, it's crazy um speaking of that just a good launch point because we were just talking before we started rolling about what the average day looks like i've been fascinated mm -hmm. with knowing that like um morning routine how do you cope with how busy that schedule is? And, and just like you said, what a day in the life, like give us a glimpse. Every day is so different. So I guess, you know, you do have to have those staples, which I think you probably have those as well, where it's fitness, nutrition, exercise, yep. uh, sorry, fitness, nutrition, sleep, right? Yep. Like, I think you have to have those kind of that base for what you're doing when you're challenged so much physically and mentally. Um, so I think you have to have that, but every day is different. I mean, Ottawa life is totally different than Peterborough life. So right yeah. now, like when I'm here, I'm on a constit week. So the house doesn't sit for two weeks. So we get what's called constituency weeks. Right. So you try to do as much outreach, connect with as many people locally as possible because the Ottawa work is super important. It's super busy. It's, but it's here mm -hmm. that you were elected. It's here that you get reelected. It's here that you are, you were elected to serve. And so you can't ever lose sight ever of your riding. And mm -hmm. I think it's easy to do that in Ottawa because it's like, a, it's a bubble. Like, yeah. I don't know how else to do It's like a university campus. Like yeah. you see the same people at the same time. It's like the Truman show drinking their Starbucks <laughs> coffee and you cross like this bizarre and you're in this yeah. like, four block radius and everybody's, you know, going and, it's just, it's a, it's a real different lifestyle. I've thought about how strange it must be. I've, you know, going back to some of your recent, uh, Instagram clips of when you get a chance to speak in the house and some of these people that stand up and, you know, like adamantly oppose what you're saying. Do you pass these people? Like there's only got to be so many burger joints, like within oh, a block you, you of, see them, do you see, you see are them you like right in after. line with them? Like at a, like, <laughs> you see them right after. Like, you're like, Hey, that's what I wondered. Hey, Mike, is it, how's it going? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It's funny that, you know, when I started, I wasn't like a political animal, right? I didn't like live mm. my life to go and, and be an MP. And so the first time I ever stepped in the house of commons was when I was elected. Like, mm -hmm. It was my first time in there. Yeah. I still remember you posting the yeah, first day you went there. Like, wow, this yeah. is really weird. And, yeah. and it's very surreal, but I think, you know, Pierre Polyev was actually amazing to me when I first started because Pierre, when you watched him in the house, he was like, he, he was incredible. Like mm -hmm. you would sit there and you would watch him and he had this poise. And when he spoke and, 
And for somebody who came from almost like a very collaborative mindset and like Mm -hmm. non-confrontational, you get in the house and it's like mental boxing, Mm -hmm. right? It's very like, Mm -hmm. it can be very somewhat, um, I don't want to use the word vicious, but it can be very yeah heated right it is. and yeah. so for somebody like me i was like oh my gosh this is awkward um and pierre was really good at guiding me because he said you know michelle you we have to engage we have to invoke that passion and as much as a lot of people will you know critique it and say it's political theater and in many ways it is because at the end of the day you do have to go back and work with that minister you do have to yeah. work across boards but there's almost a, an understanding mm-hmm. i think um much like a hockey game or a sport yeah on the ice off the ice yep. and so in the house it, it is a different dynamic mm-hmm. um but it's and it's it, I, we always make jokes. I'm like, you should put up like a noise meter or something when we're doing, <laughs> going back and forth. Like, is it, it, I know because the sides, yeah. like I heard the one, the first clip where you were try, trying to get a, a, a word in about the, uh, you know, some of the recent, uh, the liberal, uh, the, the rhetoric about improvements mm-hmm. and how, and they're like cheering you out. Yeah. And it's very loud. I can only imagine when those, when you're in there all day, yeah. how much energy could be consumed. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Don't mind if I just got to keep checking the, I'm a rookie podcast for so I got to keep checking the record you're thing. Doing, is you're live. being the real yeah. entrepreneur right now. Mitch. You're doing every job. <laughs> I totally doing totally. Doing all the jobs. That's it. Um, but so quickly, while we're talking about Pierre, the leaders in the party, how much would you, in, in like you said, you weren't politically, um, you, you didn't gear your life towards that. How much do these people influence your thinking now, the ones that are leading the parties and when you're in Ottawa versus your own? Yeah, that, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, I ran because of Aaron, Aaron mm-hmm. O'Toole, and I mm-hmm. thought, you know, there was a Peterborough connection. I liked what Aaron stood for. I saw what the country needed to take a different direction. Um, I think this job changes you, and I think the prime minister we have in power right now is not the same prime minister that ran in 2015. Yeah. And I think you just have to watch some clips of what he said versus what he says to understand that. And so I, you know, I was definitely motivated by that change. And I think that's mm-hmm. why most people go into politics. They're unhappy with something. So they want to be a part of the change and help people. Yep. So when Aaron um, was removed, which was really hard for mm-hmm. me, I'll be mm-hmm. honest, it was, that mm-hmm. was a really tough thing to endure. I didn't, I didn't like that at all. I've never been through something like that. A lot of people in, in the party hadn't. Mm-hmm. I took a, a big step back and I just said, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to wait. And I waited for a while. And, um, you know, I've always, like I said, Pierre was one of the first people I met when I got to the Hill and yep. he was just, just watching him and how he engages and how political, how politically savvy he is, but how it, how he's so hyper-focused on the economy. Mm-hmm. And I, I really liked that because mm-hmm. that's really, for me, that's the crux of the mental health issue as well, right? Mm-hmm. If you can't pay mm-hmm. your bills, if if you don't know if you can put gas in your car, that that weighs on you and an anxiety and depression mm-hmm. and maybe you start drinking a bit more. Maybe mm-hmm. I mean, it's all of those things. And so if we can take care of that. But to your point, I mean, there's 11 candidates running. Yeah. That's crazy. That is. Um, and so as a, <laughs> as a rookie, um, what do you do, right? This is your own party. It's, very, it's a very challenging position to be put in if mm-hmm. you think about it. So imagine you're on a team. And you have to pick, there's five people running for captain. Yeah. And you put your name behind one. What does that do to the team? Yeah. It's, it's interesting, yeah. right? It's an interesting yeah. dynamic. And so I think um, I sat back, I watched, I have great amount of respect for everybody who's put their name in because personally, I, would just, I just can't imagine doing that. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, I had to sit back. I had to, to really pick what fit with me. I, I listened before I put my, my public endorsement out. Mm-hmm. I knew as soon as I knew Pierre was running, I felt pretty good about mm-hmm. Pierre. Cause like I said, but I wanted to listen to everybody. I wanted to take in everything. Um, but Pierre for me is the right person for this job and mm-hmm. what we need for the country. And that is the economy, right? Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's being able to afford the cost of living. I think this is just the umbrella issue. When we look at housing, which we'll probably talk about, this yeah. is it. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't agree more. I like the calculate, like how, how, because of Pierre's approach, looking at the economy, everything can be, um, accounted for. Like you, you can actually measure progress mm-hmm. because you have metrics to track. Whereas you don't really see the liberal approach doesn't so, so much rely on a data driven approach. It's more feel 
that's mm-hmm. always the the sort mm-hmm. of the, what they sell. And so I do like that approach because you can say by what factors you have improved the standards of living, right? Yeah, I think you need to have a real pragmatic approach mm-hmm. because for somebody who is like a pretty big empath, like I'm a pretty big feeler mm-hmm. type of person and in, in my personality, it's a challenge to know that you will never make everyone happy. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can't give everyone what they need. And I always liken it, Mitch, to parenting. Yeah. It's very similar to parenting. Yeah. You have to make tough decisions with pragmatic reasons and you've got to remove a lot of that i'm emotion. listening very intently because we're re- i'm reading a parenting book right now because we're every day we question how, it's you know, really yeah. hard because you you want to meet those emotional needs because they're very important but you need somebody who can make pragmatic mm-hmm. calculated decisions that don't just make you feel good mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i think that's i think that's where the liberals you know the more i do this the more partisan i get because you see the words come out, you, you read mm-hmm. the words in the budget, but there's never any action that goes along with it. And the words are great. <laughs> For sure. But like in theory, the ideology, you're like, great, we're going to help everybody. Yeah. Okay. But we can't. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a really tough thing to say to people. And you know, for somebody who is in a bellwether riding where I have as many people who will never vote for me as maybe people who will, and you get that pushback, you have to, you have to stay strong and rooted in, in, in values Mm -hmm. and pragmatic decisions that actually help the greater good. Yeah. And, and that again comes to economy. And so that's, I mean, that's the principle of, of conservatism at its core. Yeah. Let the government get out of the way, let you run your life, let you make decisions that serve you best and, you know, trust, put the trust in the people yep. that Canadians are at, at our core, really kind hearted, caring people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh gosh. So many launch points, mm-hmm. uh, that we could go to. I think of when you, when you talked about the economy and I, like you said, how you can't help everybody, a quote comes to mind, uh, from, from Thomas Sowell, one of the guys who wrote a book, basic economics. It's like one of the old, uh, economic books. And he says the word economy in its step, you know, just by its nature denotes that you have the need to economize. You can't do everything. Otherwise there'd be no need to, it wouldn't be labeled an economy if you didn't have to economize. And the example he draws is, is, uh, on a battlefield is that if medics show up and they only have a limited amount of supplies. And if there was people who were wounded, uh, but they would definitely make it. There was people who were wounded and, and if they don't get immediate help, they might not make it. And then there's people who are wounded way too far beyond. There's no saving them. And if you simply just don't have enough supplies to go around, you can't just say, I'm going to get more supplies. I'll be right. Like things need to be done in mm-hmm. this time frame, And there's a, a, a rate of decay that decisions have to be made and you have to economize because you, and you just have to pick what's what prioritize. Yeah. Prioritize. And so I think a lot of people that's lost on that, that the, our economy and the decisions of the government, how money gets allocated, government budget falls under that same criteria, but then the current government pr- t- tends to over, spend and that's Pierre's mm-hmm. biggest thing I think is that there's a lot of promises they they just their resu- the answer is not no we can't save that person we go, it, it's no we can save everybody we'll get there's more we, yeah, we could just bring more 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 but mm-hmm. who pays for it and these the the deficits and there's a whole uh I just came from a grade 10 civics class giving a talk on what an MP does for a day and I was blown away by these 15 year olds because, you know, when we look at pharma care and we look at dental care and we look at all of these ideal ideology things that sound great, because guess what? Everybody should have access to dental care. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Who's paying for it? And yeah. these, these yeah. kids were saying, who pays for it? Yeah. How, where does that come from? And I said, you've just, you've just started. <laughs> That's a hundred percent. Cause you can extend the argument to, well, I mean, waterfront to live on waterfront property. Mm-hmm. It's extremely good for your mental health because the water mm-hmm. is, is there, there, there's effects from being by the water. It's very calming. Mm-hmm. Well, it should be a national right. Everybody should have a right to waterfront. And you can just take that lineage to the extreme yeah. and you can impose it on anything. You know <laughs> what I mean? Well, that on my next that's campaign, it. Like, I, you know, like that's it. Waterfront for everyone. There's, it was no, you know, not. Well, and, it's a running joke we say in the house. Unicorns for everyone. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. it's, 
And I think the other thing that people don't understand, I love, I love what you said about the battlefield. It's when the economy, and it's funny, my 15 year old is great at this. He goes, what do you mean by the economy? Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's a great question. Cause mm -hmm. it's very abstract for people, right? Yeah. But when things are flowing. And so I always say, okay, bring it back to your house. When mm -hmm. you have money coming in and you can put money out, so you can go to the store and you can buy Easter presents cause we're shooting this during Easter. You can, yep. you can buy a new chair. You can do that. When you have money in or you're at the till and they say, hey, would you like to donate an extra $2 to the breakfast program? You say, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, for me, the crux of social services. Mm -hmm. Because the more we have actually operating where people don't get into this, into this feeling of um, not enough, mm -hmm. right? And you feel more like abundance. Bounty, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can give more. And charities, not-for-profits, they're so reliant on that. And that's how they, that's how they exist. Mm -hmm. And so if you start to shut down the middle class, mm -hmm. which, which is happening mm -hmm. and they can't afford to buy bananas, mm -hmm. then what's happening to that breakfast program that you did give $2 to what's mm -hmm. happening to that charity that you were giving, that mm -hmm. you were able to, you, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, just, it's a, such a domino impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I, I know what you mean. I've never thought about it that way. There's been the limited times where you go to where that the $2 at the end of the thing. And if you're in a spot where you're in a cash flow crunch, it sometimes you could justify if you've got to say no, but then the rest of the time you do, and it's, it is related to your finances and for every, that, that trade off between, am I going to spend a couple bucks on this or a couple bucks on that. But you know that if you spend a couple bucks on that, you don't have it to spend on something else. And sometimes government doesn't take that approach because they own the printing press. And, <laughs> you know, but but at the end of the day, somebody's got to pay for it. But um, I feel like we could go down a big rabbit hole on that. So let's flip to to housing. Mm -hmm. um, the What do you see as the most pressing issue right now when it comes to home prices? Oh. We talked about this and I, I, yeah. mean, I think we're still in the same boat. It's mm -hmm. worse than mm -hmm. when we talked, yeah. you know, seven months ago. How do you now say to, you know, Tom and Sarah who bought their first home, 1100 square foot bungalow mm -hmm. sided, one bedroom, no garage for $730,000, 800 by the time they're done paying CMHC yep. and the taxes on CMHC. Yeah. Well, you know, we've taken care of inflation and now your house is worth four. Yeah. You can't, that's, I know that's you, the hard how part. How do you is, go yeah. backward? <laughs> I know. That's what a lot of people don't realize is that these, you can't, the government doesn't, what well, you can't let it go back. And so many of the valuations, so many businesses have expanded based on the value of their real estate. So many people have extended credit to buy things and buy other things based on these prices. And to go back now would be devastating. But then how do you expect joe and sam to enter to even enter so we are at a major <laughs> we've gone crisis. so far there's no quick solution now there's almost no um immediate answer right these conversations whenever i have them with people that really focus on this stuff all the time unfortunately seem to revolve you know always revert back to the discussion of areas that have become um renter nations europe etc mm -hmm. a lot of places mm -hmm. that just they shot past this period where we had a you have a window to figure it out mm -hmm. and then once it's gone past this level where our our incomes have stayed here and the prices mm -hmm. have gone here and the only way to get them backed within a, a common metric people talk about all the time is you know how many times how many times your annual income a house cost and and uh it's still in alberta in recent years out there you could it could be three years three times your annual income so you know you could make you could make uh, or a household can easily make a hundred thousand dollars out there. An individual can can quite easily do it on the on the oil mm -hmm. rigs there. And mm -hmm. a, and a home there's there's modest like decent homes in the three hundred thousand yeah. dollar range, mm -hmm. um, in in Red Deer and places Lethbridge. Um, everybody's and, everybody's searching Red Deer right now. Yeah, like, there's like, lots of activity there. there. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of and yeah. a lot of people are shuffling out there. Um, but uh, here it's within memory for a lot of people when it was closer to three times your annual income to buy a home in, in, in Peterborough, not too long ago, you could buy a home for $300,000, a pretty decent one. Um, talking back like right 2014 yeah. and now in a lot of situations, it's more like 10 times people's income. Well, so it was 464, 464, I think, no, 830 something thousand. Let me scratch that. 
$434,000, I believe, was the average cost of the home in 2015. Yeah. It's and so they've eight, officially it's, doubled. It's yeah. 868. Yeah. And, and incomes have, um, I mean, what, nudged ahead of uh, even double digit percentages? I don't think so, you know? Yeah. Um, so how do you get back within a reasonable within reach of, of that basic wage earner, that, that problem is, is extremely difficult. I think, you know, I think the real issue, it, it, this has always got to be your, I mean, you're in it, you're mm -hmm. living it. You're mm -hmm. living the real estate agent life. If I were to ask you right now, how, uh, how much stock do you have? I want to go look at some houses. How many do you have? <sighs> well, it's, it's actually increasing at the moment. There was points this year in Peterborough when there was less than 20 homes available in the entire city. Um, which is absolutely insane. Um, but, but it's growing. The inventory is on the rise this month, yeah. particularly in the last couple of weeks in particular, uh, the interest rates have been on the move. So it's putting a lot of, there's a lot of shifting, a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. Like as we speak, big things are happening in the real estate world. But here's the problem is that prices on, on a comparable basis, month over month, we're seeing prices drop, but the cost of ownership the interest rates are rising rapidly. The five year, the fixed rates just moved huge um, over the last couple of months and the variable rates on the rise. We've got an interest rate announcement coming tomorrow. A lot of people like the market's pricing in another half percentage point raise. Um, the majority of the market is, 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 pigeonholed into variables now it's not a, it's not as e even as a split as it used to be between variable and fixed so a lot of people are in variable every time that that overnight lending rate by the bank of canada goes up it's it's and here's the thing is that when in in, in, in prior years a doubling of the interest rate was from three to six percent now a, a doubling is is from one to two and then again you know so we're people's payments are changing rapidly so the problem is is that Prices are dropping, and they seem to be this month. Um, it doesn't solve the affordability issue because they're dropping because people can't stretch themselves as far because their ability to leverage themselves has been decreased. So on, on in terms of how much of their monthly income is going towards a payment, still the same amount, mm -hmm. it may reflect that the home prices are dropping. And that's one thing people are already saying that some of the recent um, legislation that that has come through in terms of the foreign home buyers ban, you mm -hmm. know, that, that the Liberal government might be able to just point and say, look, it worked. Because home price, mm -hmm. as the interest rates rise now, prices are going to feel some downward pressure. But the game of musical chairs hasn't improved. It's going to be in relative terms, the scarcity of housing is still the exact same. And all it's going to mean is that, you know, you name it, uh, you know, Joe and whoever mm -hmm. going to buy a home, they're now with their $2,000 a month in pre-approval, instead of being able to afford $800,000 or, or 700, they can now only afford 650 because the interest rates have gone up. Mm -hmm. So prices will see some downward pressure, but it doesn't mean the situation's improved. You still need the supply. You still, absolutely. So we're you still st need the supply. <laughs> and I, I don't know how else to say it so simply, right? I said to, to a group of people, they said, well, that, how does that fix anything? And I said, if you have 10 grapes, Mm -hmm. And there's 500 people who need a grape. Mm -hmm. How valuable are the grapes? Mm -hmm. If there are 500 grapes and 500 people, for sure. How valuable is the grape? Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a very simple equation in in so many regard. And and I think, I mean, you could speak on this more. And I'm I, I like listening to your your perspective because you're in the thick of it. But it's like when you have this these permits and these delays mm -hmm. and the costs, like in the video I was showing you earlier with Pierre mm -hmm. and the average cost, and, and he was at standing out front of that $4.8 million home in Vancouver that looks yep. like, like it's a rundown shack, basically. Yep. And he's saying $644,000 per home is in fees is in fees in a municipal yeah. level like that's um, insane yeah so i think uh in in garnet northy who um I, I actually had him on here last week and and i think we'll both speak tomorrow is that he has a fantastic view on this stuff and and so i'll i'll take some of his insights from mm. from last week um because he is is like an encyclopedia on the yeah, the real nitty-gritty of the red tape um and and he brought up some fascinating points about that and one thing that i it's so funny because you know when you pay at the pumps like on on the the gas pumps they they disclose how much of it is taxed it's right there if they did the same thing for a home they put a sign on the front lawn you know when a roofer finishes your roof and they put a roof up like mm -hmm. done by feeney roofing mm -hmm. or, or or you know um nice shout out there by the way 
What's that? I said, nice shout out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and what, like you know, if the if 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 you built a new home and there was a sign on the front lawn that showed what percentage of oh, that like home was tax. CMHC fees. Yeah, CMHC. Obviously, development charge. A lot of the stuff is is uh, municipal. It's a large source of the municipal mm-hmm. funds is is through through real estate. But I think people don't realize because it's a, it's a it's a sort of a complex calculation to show how much of the cost of a home is tax. And, and so in, in, in just jumping through hoops. Um, so the red tape is a really big one. And I think that a lot of, so, so some recent legislation on speeding up the approvals, um, people saying, okay, that's, they're, they're, they're trying to force the municipalities to speed things up. The municipalities know they got a problem. They don't like being behind by a hundred approvals, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and, and everybody riding them. Um, so, so I don't think that the, the, the pizza delivery model is going to be, you know, if it's not there in 30 minutes, it's free. Like, cause they're talking about finding the municipalities if it doesn't come through mm-hmm. quick enough. These like locally in Peterborough, um, the, the, from the planning department, we see them showing up to, to Peterborough Home Builder Association meetings after hours. They're showing up on webinars to try and mm-hmm. talk to people about like, Hey, here's where we're at. They're really trying to do it. Um, but a lot of the problem, so when you look at positive examples of where things have worked, so there was a real kind of, I guess, bull market in real estate out in Alberta um, between 2011, probably extended over to 2014, yep. 2015, there was a bit of a shake in in, in the oil prices and, and the job market there got hit. But in that period, it would have been plausible to say that the, the prices in Alberta should have rose because a lot of people moved out there for jobs. Um, but, but the price of real estate stayed so close to stable, you know, like the type of appreciation that people used to be able to grow up and rely on three to 5% a year, mm-hmm. where at the size of an investment that a home is, if it appreciates by three to 5% based on the amount of capital you have in there, still a really good amount of money. Um, and you don't need 10, 20% annual growth on real estate to make everybody wealth. You need consistency, predictability, you know, in terms of inflation mm-hmm. being, yeah. we have a Bank of Canada targets inflation. Realistically, they should include home prices a bit more in their, in their criteria for what they target. Because if people know that they're targeting three to 5% a year appreciation values in homes, it just sets the tone a little bit more. You're not going to be an overnight millionaire, but if you invest in property in Canada and you become a homeowner and try and pull yourself out of the rentership and 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 take the leap to get into homeownership, you're going to have a safe, predictable, reliable increase in your value. It does. It's, it shouldn't be the seesaw, financialized up and down. Um, but I veered off. I was talking about Alberta. When Alberta did not see the same type of appreciation as we have in recent years. And it, from my own, this is purely anecdotal, but I do have, I have a friend uh, that is a builder and his family's a builder here in Ontario. They build around the Coburg, Port Hope region. And he went out there and he actually bought some, some lots and built some homes. And he's actually who I bought a home off of out there at the time. We didn't realize it. And then we connected the dots. Our families know each other. And he said, it was just so easy. It was so easy to buy land and build a home. It was just like, that's all you need me to do. You know, in the equivalent of, of, um, the hoops that you have to jump through here, he just said, it's, it's basically like, I just had to give a scratch napkin, mm. you know, and, and the amount of, so right down from the, the lack of what they required in terms of getting permits, but more specifically the lens through which they view the approval process of their land. That is kind of the, seems to be one of the biggest things. Um, Ian Mudd, who's with the, the, the county of mm-hmm, Peterborough mm-hmm. there uh, spoke at the land planning assembly that was put on by PCAR a couple of weeks ago. And he labeled uh, basically the green belt and a lot of the, the areas that are blocked off for development just as the big green blob, uh, stating that it, it was really non-discriminatory. And then Garnet did a great job of highlighting uh, when I talked to him last week about how when they went back to the provincial government and said like, hey, this stuff's labeled as prime ag but it's not really farmable, hasn't been farmed for years, and it probably never will be. Uh, why can't we get a severance on this? And it sounded like they it didn't get anywhere. They don't want to hear it. So I think that it's not so much the speed of the approvals, it's the lens through which we view what type of land is buildable. And it seems to be a lot of criteria on density, and everybody really wants density, and it seems to be almost on the, the ph- philosophical level over everything they don't want to hear the nitty-gritty like well guys this isn't farmable land it's not prime ag 
If it's prime ag, you go buy it and farm it because then now the owner can't sell it because they can't get a severance and they can't farm it. There's, so I'm you know, laughing at you because there's a story of the exact same thing. There's a guy and he owns a, like an acre of land mm -hmm. at the end of a road and they've deemed it prime ag. Like, what are you going to farm on an <laughs> acre of land? <laughs> what, are, like, what are you doing? And so yeah. I, I think it's, you know, it's interesting because I spoke and I, I got some pushback about my my feedback on housing and, and what i what i say because i say you know this it's this red tape and well what does red tape mean what does that mean mm -hmm. and, and it, it, it it's all those things that you've just said but it's then there's the pushback of like well isn't the red tape in place to make sure that we're doing our job safely and correctly mm -hmm. well, not always mm -hmm. not always and I, I think when we can look at models that work you know, when we look at that Alberta, I think those, I think that's really important. And I think it, it's just like the amount of time to get a shovel in the ground. Mm -hmm. You're not keeping up with the demand. It's like waiting in line for a hamburger. Yeah. There's 20 people in line, but you're only putting one on the grill at a time. There's no <laughs> reflexivity of supply. It can't no. respond. No. There's people that want to build homes. There's builders that want to make money right now. <laughs> if they could only just... There's a do the job yeah <laughs> totally so and then, and then you have the other argument of well you need the people to build the houses absolutely so you need the skilled laborers as well for sure so on the note of the approvals and or, or more so land planning mm -hmm. um i i guess what do you see as a way forward like in our local you know in peterborough um because one municipality cannot solve this issue like here's when if peterborough just becomes the most sort of laissez-faire uh in terms of planning and they just let it let everybody build where they wanted to it it, it would we couldn't absorb our surrounding area whitby uh pickering right on through the gta it's all a ripple effect and all our prices are interconnected mm -hmm. they're very interrelated mm -hmm. where um, all that would happen is just more people from Whitby, Oshawa would continue to move here before it moved the needle on our affordability because people would see opportunity here. But mm -hmm. we would, it, you need a, a, a whole concerted effort from all of the, that's the thing is Peterborough, we can go ahead and solve our, uh, you know, sort of planning woes and, and, and green light projects. But arguably, I think in my view is that it doesn't solve the pricing issue because relatively speaking, the prices in Peterborough aren't going to drop if Oshawa hasn't solved their problem and Whitby hasn't solved their problem because yeah. if prices are still sky high there, there's only going to be so much of a discrepancy between a 45-minute drive and there'll be this sort of arbitrage effect where people will just keep bidding Peterborough up so that it's only so much mm -hmm. cheaper than Ottawa based on how much they're willing, or in Oshawa, pardon me, and 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 so on. So it's a province why as much as we're talking about Peterborough and you're representing Peterborough, mm -hmm. really this is a provincial issue. So it's Canada-wide. It's Canada wide. No, I think out less 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 so in the prairies and in Alberta, and they tend to have they veer towards a more conservative mindset. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit more pragmatic, less controlling, less big government, less mm -hmm. you know um, control by 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 special interest groups, and more free enterprise. Um, but I guess. <laughs> just to flip it back, like, what do you think is the best way forward? What can anybody do right now? What do we do? What, what's the, you know, what do you, what do you feel as like, what's our next charge here? You know, I think, I think I've heard this, like, there's like a lack of hope. Mm -hmm. Like people are like, what, what's going to, like, there's genuine mm -hmm. fear for your kids, mm -hmm. for yourself. What's the point? Mm -hmm. What are we doing? And then when the NDP coalition came, a lot of people really felt deflated yeah right and i think i think it's you can't go backward really you can't hurt these people's investment but you've got to stabilize the market mm -hmm. and i just don't feel like anything is stabilized right now mm -hmm. so i think i think what do you do it sounds kind of not very action oriented because I'm like, like, tell me what to, like, I'll go dig the yeah, ditch. Yeah, like, like <laughs> Just give me, yeah, like, yeah. Tell yeah. me to go dig the ditch or whatever. And mm -hmm. I think, I think what it is, is, is actually paying attention, getting involved, mm -hmm. critically thinking and mm -hmm. assessing what's happening, mm -hmm. being a part of something. I mean, you have to push back. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's hard. Like what I said at the beginning of this confrontation or conflict mm -hmm. is, 
and I don't think it has to be messy. I think you can, like, I think you, you did a really nice job there, Mitch, of talking about the people in the planning Thank department you. don't want it to be this backlogged. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think at the heart of each Canadian, regardless of where you're at, you, you act a party you align with, you want people to have mm-hmm. a happy life. Like mm-hmm. I, I actually still have that in me. It's mm-hmm. slowly getting chipped away, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it's still there. And yeah. I, so I think you have to get involved. You have to push back. You have to get yourself educated. You have to be mm-hmm. a critical thinker. Mm-hmm. You, you, you can't sort of just say, oh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, what's it matter? Mm-hmm. You know, go into meetings, listening, signing up for a leadership and listening and mm-hmm. listening to solutions. Like w- we know what the problems are and that's important because you can only figure out solutions when you figure out like what doesn't work. Well, we know right now mm-hmm. this first time home incentive buyer program it's not working. No, no, for sure. It's uh, just to say we did something. It's not working. And so I think, I think there has to be that action that goes along with it. And I think if you're not having conversations with the Mitch Clearies of the world and the Garnet Northies <laughs> of the world and the planning departments at municipality levels, mm-hmm. how are you ever supposed to make policy mm-hmm. that actually helps you if I don't know what your problems are? Yeah. And so I think, you know, I think it's reaching out, it's connecting, it's telling people. I think there's this, we have this weird thing as Canadians. I don't want to bug them. Mm -hmm. I don't don't know. I know. I don't want to say anything. Yeah. (laughs) And it's really weird, right? Because it's like, that's actually what exactly you're, and I'm, I'm just as guilty of that. Where you're like, well, they probably already know that. Yeah. Right. They, they must know that. Yeah. Let me tell you, working in government, I'm in the machine. No, don't, I know. not everybody knows it's, what there's what to do. <laughs> the communication walls around all manner of political issues is is um, I think it it paralyzes information from rising to the surface because it's so much easier to sit down with your family for dinner and just talk about how your kid grew an inch and uh, you know like be happy just focus on the happy things Look and to, your then, blue pants. you know like then to talk about that. anything real yeah you know or not that that's not real i don't mean that of, of course and that's but, important yeah. too yeah it is absolutely and it does bring us great joy so it can't all be the hard talk all the time but i it is i, I can see it even uh just to, to, to talk about that stuff right and actually talk you know um and i think that because the at the the political divide, I know a lot of friends that uh, throughout the whole pandemic, um, really d- political differences rose to the surface, unfortunately, and a lot of people sort of veered off or polarized views. And I think that we've got to realize we're all humans. Everybody's entitled to an, uh, an opinion, but we're all just in some totally uninformed way hurled into this life and we're seeking happiness and we all have different views of based on where we were born how we were raised whatever and and someone like i'm you know my family was conservative and so i've i've grew up listening to so many of those arguments so it will take a, an awful lot to ever knock me off of the the perspective that i have but somebody who was born in a liberal household and their family really they've seen all the highlights of of that i understand that someone's gonna have a hard time really veering towards the conservative side of the arguments but how do we move forward if we don't talk and everybody just, boom, you go that way, I go that way. We don't agree, you know? Well, and I think you hit a, I think you hit an interesting, when we look at political strategy, it's really important that, you know, most Canadians sit, we're pretty centrist at the end, like mm-hmm. most Canadians. Mm-hmm. But the political spectrum, and going back to what I said to you about Trudeau, Mm -hmm. who he was in 2015 and who he is right now Mm -hmm. is not the same person. Mm -hmm. He's aligned with it. We basically have an NDP government in power. Mm -hmm. It's unicorns for everyone. Mm -hmm. And look at what it's doing. Mm -hmm. There's, There's pros and cons to every government. But I guess what I would say to people is to to challenge what you think you know. Mm -hmm. Because I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, it's the the political spectrum the social spectrum who we are has completely shifted Mm -hmm. and what you thought was liberal Mm -hmm. i mean go grab a a kretchen government and ask him if he would be okay (laughs) no absolutely yeah it's very well put and so i think you have to challenge what you think you know and i've and i've heard this repeatedly oh pierre polyev he's far right i'm like he's not Mm -hmm. far Mm -hmm. right 
he's not pandering. Yeah. And I think sometimes people confuse those two things that mm-hmm. if you really say something with conviction and we've had a real ideological shift, mm-hmm. we have like, imagine telling your grandmother or great grandmother that people don't have a gender anymore. Yeah. Like, like these kinds of things that are happening in our world. And that's not bad or it's just evolution of Leaves society and, yeah. and culture and and where we, so we grow as humanity and as a result, so does the political spectrum. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's okay to say, you know what? I, I don't know if I'm still in the same place. And I think there's an allegiance sometimes mm-hmm. to a party. Um, and sometimes that's okay to, to say, I think I've grown and, and changed. And mm-hmm. as a result, so has my political allegiance. Mm-hmm. I, I think that. you're right. And we need the center. I, I just keep an eye on the time well, yeah. Kid. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um i we need the center because I, I heard a good bit about this just recently how like the how the united states is so divided that the then the political like in the in their political house the, you can't do anything you can't get anything done no. you know it's it's out of out of great disruption comes extreme growth mm-hmm and we are in a period of extreme disruption mm-hmm. and it's uncomfortable mm-hmm. and um, miserable. Mm-hmm. But I think, I think if we can, you know, I think it's going to take people like you, Mitch, who are really sort of deep, deep level thinkers to, to look around and open up dialogue and conversation and not a, you're wrong and I'm right. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing I say to people is we need to switch from and to or mm-hmm. or sorry from or to and mm-hmm. we need to switch from or to and you're either this you're either with me or you're against me mm-hmm. you're either believe what i believe or you're wrong you are either think what i think or you're wrong mm-hmm. it's like i can think what i think and listen to your perspective mm-hmm. what happened to and mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. what happened to and mm-hmm. i always say that i'm like what where did it go mm-hmm. um and so i think but we've this has been a big problem. The, the phone, uh, social media has been a big problem. Being isolated from people has been a big problem. You don't get to talk things out. You don't see someone's mm-hmm. eyes. Mm-hmm. I don't see you as a father. I don't see you as a human, a husband. Mm-hmm. I just see you as some guy on the internet that says, <laughs> you should do this and do that. And, yeah. Yeah, and and then this vitriol starts and that it's, it's, not, it's not who we are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The community, the communication in, in being like g- gathering, you know, I, what I have close friends that are on opposite sides of the political spectrum, mm-hmm. but you know them so well and you love them so much and you've grown up, had so many bonding experiences mm-hmm. through thick and thin that you would never think about, like when sometimes people think about somebody with an opposite belief system and they think of it as like this other, other person, not you know, it's faceless. And then you think these are, this is your family. These, you know, these are people just like you. And, um, I think what happens is when you are personally suffering mm-hmm. and that's what we have, we have people suffering. So they don't have that empathy. They've lost it because I can't afford to feed my family. Mm-hmm. I don't care about your, I don't care anymore because I, I can't see past that because I can't afford to feed my family. I can't afford a house. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think the walls are built. And I think that's where resentment comes in politically. Yeah. I And I can see that. It's a good... So to turn on to... Well, we, we got a, a few minutes left. I'd like to hear your views because I know it's something you're passionate about. Um, the mental health mm-hmm. aspect. And and uh, people in Peterborough... I, I, the, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, sort of our downtown scene and and what goes on here and and how to properly deal with um you know individuals who have who have you know come on hard times and and how what the next step is um i'm interested in your thoughts on all kinds of things mm-hmm. but for the sake of of, of of five minutes can i bring one argument up or, or a, a thing that, something that people they they mention to me all the time and people seem to repeat it as like a truism and i just want to kind of bounce it off you for mm-hmm. your opinion is that peterborough has been very sensitive and accommodating at least as far as i'm aware to to those who are addicted to to you know hard substances mm-hmm. and and who have you know fallen into to homelessness now i know that we're still 
already over capacity with what we can bear there. But in regards, specific regards to the um, safe injection sites and whatnot, people commonly mention that they think that Peterborough has become so welcoming to that that we there's a chance that we're pulling from other municipalities. Mm-hmm. People will cross, mm-hmm. you know, leave from Oshawa to mm-hmm. come here. <sighs> Do you think there's any truth in that or what's... Listen, if, if you build it, they will come, right? There's that whole theory. I think this is a very, very, very complex conversation. And yeah. I think you have to change how you think, talk, and treat mental health. Mm-hmm. Safe injection site is a, is a, is a rung on a ladder. Mm-hmm. It is not prevention and it is not recovery. Mm-hmm. It's in the middle to hopefully get you to the point where you're going to get recovery and get out. Mm-hmm. We have to change how we look at addiction. For me, it all starts in those first 10, you know... 15, 10 to 15 years. Mm. If we're not investing in youth, that trauma that happens, there's always exceptions. There's Mm. always circumstance that happens outside of that. Somebody could have grown up in a perfectly lovely home and not experienced any trauma. But when we invest in the youth mental health aspect of things, when we learn how to emotionally regulate, when we learn how to manage our feelings, when we learn what a healthy relationship is, uh, these are all contributing factors to our success. When we learn that we need to contribute to society, have a purpose, go out and do meaningful things, give back to the world, you know, we start to be whole in ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's this, it sounds very hocus pocusy, but if we are who, if we are good with who we are mm-hmm. and happy, back to your point of the happiness, This is a key point. We have the second highest overdose rate in the province. We Mm -hmm. have nobody here. We have nothing here for recovery. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. We have no rehab. Mm -hmm. That's awful, right? So safe injection site is is good in that, yay, you know, it's helping some people, but it's not good in that, so where do they go if they want rehab? Mm -hmm. And so we don't have that in place. And so if you're going to do this and do it well, you need full wraparound services. Mm -hmm. I went to East Hastings Street in Vancouver. Have Mm -hmm. you ever been there? No, heard about it. I'm interested to hear your perspective. It would change your, you cannot describe it. You can't, you can't do anything except experience it. Mm -hmm. It's, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And Mm -hmm. there's, you know, I walk by corpses on the street. It's, it's, it's another level of poverty and extremism that, that, you know, and I met a guy and I'm going to bring him here and he died six times of overdoses, consumption treatment site saved his life. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but addiction is, is not, it's a disease. Mm -hmm. And so we have Mm -hmm. to change how we look at it. But you also, at the end of the day, the only person who's going to help Mitch Mm -hmm. is Mitch. Mm -hmm. I can give you all of the things I can throw everything at you. But there still has to be accountability, mm-hmm. personal accountability. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's where, where you find that, where people say, we're just enabling. Mm-hmm. There's a real heart and it's back to parenting. Am I enabling my child by being empathetic to their needs and, and, and making them dependent? Or am I, what's that fine line that we always have to walk mm-hmm. to help but to give autonomy for you to take back control of your life. It's very complicated. Yeah, it's extremely complicated. And I appreciate your insights on it because I've not thought nearly as deeply as you have about it. So I know it's it's one that uh, nobody obviously has the answers to. Uh, it's always going to be here. We're always going to have human suffering and we're always going to find maladaptive coping mechanisms to suffering. And I guess, so the answer in quick is, is to try and build out some some rehab on the other side of that harm reduction is beyond harm reduction. You're buying time and you're leaving it up to chance whether what the results are prevention and recovery. Mm -hmm. And so for us on conservative end of things, prevention is really where we would like to invest our, our time Mm -hmm. and, and resources Mm -hmm. and recovery. Yeah. I'd I'd love to pick your brain on what that looks like specifically. Uh, but I know we're, we're, yeah, that's another, (laughs) I know totally we're almost out of time. So I guess any, any, uh, words for, for folks that are watching this primarily, uh, interested in, I mean, really real estate prices and affordability in, in the Peterborough area, any, any last words or thoughts? I think we need you. I think you need to, I think you need to use your voice. You need to message your MPs. You need to talk to your counselors. You need to tell people who are in positions to make change what is happening in your life. Mm -hmm. I cannot effectively do my job if I don't know what your real struggles are. Mm -hmm. And that is what I struggle with every time when I sit there and I hear the budget that was delivered and the Minister of Finance, Christian Freeland, stands up and says, Canada has got a booming economy. 
I guess we're getting different emails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're getting different emails. And yeah. that is what's frustrating for me because yeah. that is not who I'm hearing from. I'm hearing from people who are genuinely suffering and, you know, we're working really hard. And I, you know, I hope get involved in the leadership race, whoever you want to put your name behind, get involved, you know, and maybe you're not concerned, whatever you mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. who just get involved and bring solutions to the table, bring your stories to the table and start dialogue and communication. Yeah. Cause that's how we get to action because we need the ideas to say, oh, and, and it happens like that. Absolutely. And so on that note, because most times uh, it's a common thing when somebody's on a podcast to say, well, where can people get a hold of you? And it's somebody <laughs> trying to promote a business. So let's like, if anybody wants to reach out with, say, like a particularly touching story or they just want a voice, hey, like, who can I like... If you your email, be, your social media, like, is there any positive format? What's the best way for people to, to give funnel, you some support? Social well, media is always great if you're positive, but mm -hmm. if you really want an answer, it's hard to answer everything on social media because there's thousands of messages. Mm -hmm. I have to be your MP. Mm -hmm. I have to tell people that I get messages from across the country. It's protocol. You have to go through your own MP. If, like I can still listen to you, but it, really you have to go to your own MP. Mm -hmm. But if you want to, if you have an actual concern, you have to email me. I funnel everybody to my email. So mm -hmm. it's one, one area. It's like triage. And you probably have all sorts of people or at least somebody, uh, uh, I mean, I one hope because otherwise you're going all hours of the day to yeah. give somebody to help sort and sift through that. So somebody can, yeah, we try to do it as yeah. best as we can. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Um, so we got a couple minutes left morning routine. I'd love to hear it. What's the wake up what's the start oh, time in Ottawa? It depends. Usually I say between five, five forty-five. Yep. And uh try to get as good a sweat on as I can. Coffee? I wish I drank coffee. No? I wish I it's did. It's funny, Steve Harper didn't drink doesn't drink coffee either. Eh? And Obama doesn't either. I can't. Yeah. I hate the taste of it. <laughs> um I wish I, I would. Uh I'm a tea drinker. Yeah. Um and So uh, caffeine nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. And just uh just get that blood flow going and uh it really makes a huge difference and trying to get to bed at a decent time and trying not to have too much screen time because it's I it's know really hard. that's what I find kills you. That's because the wind down routine is as important. I can only imagine how many emails yeah. and, and whatnot. Meditation? It's just not, we don't get along. Can't no <laughs> can't do it. I can't turn the only time I can yeah. turn my brain off really is when I sleep and when I am sweating. Like when I'm doing an exercise where it's like I'm gonna die. Yeah. That's it. That's I that's know, it. that's that's, that's it. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Oh man. Awesome. Well, I know we could, uh, keep going for, for, I, I could keep asking you questions for another hour for sure. I know. I'm um, not worried about your child yeah. getting off the bus and nobody there. I know. So we better get going. So, okay. Thanks so much everybody for watching. Michelle, thank you for being thank here. Thank you, Mitch. And, uh, yeah, um, hopefully we'll talk again in the future. I'm sure we will. Awesome. Okay. Take care guys.